And we get started with the next talk for meeting C++ 2023. Right now, we will have Vladimir Wisniewski talk about dependency injection patterns, efficiency, and usability. Um, really interesting topic. Please take it away, Vladimir. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, uh, thank you, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Vladimir Wisniewski. I would like to offer this talk that is called uh, Dependency Inject Injection Patterns, Efficiency and Usability. Uh, material from this talk it was originally prepared to be a part of a uh, test-driven development of embedded and system-level software presentation for ACCU uh, this year. Uh, it did not fit there because of the time frame limitation, uh, so it was extracted and reworked, extended uh, to become a separate uh, talk. Uh, it's still influenced by a testing topic and offers some overview of the basics of dependency injection techniques uh, that are available in C++ and reviews it from the usability, including testability and efficiency perspective. I think the most of the talk is uh, so belongs to back to basics level, but there will be also some advanced parts as well. So why dependency injection is important? Yeah, so we are following some design principles and practices when we are designing our software. Yeah, so um, those, or we are encouraged to follow those design principles and practices. Uh, those uh, principles and practices can be decomposition, decoupling, uh, some uh, something like single responsibility principle, separation of concerns. And uh, the overlap there is that following different motivation and different criteria, we split some functionality into smaller parts. And dependency injection is important because it allows to reassemble those reduced um, units into more complex parts of software. Uh, dependency injection state, uh, principle states that the units, they should not be dependent on um, uh, concrete types, but they should be dependent on some abstractions. And those design principles, they are important because if we follow them, yes, yeah, so we can achieve some minimalist items that is easier to implement and modify. We have some items with clearer requirements and interfaces. Uh, we can reuse those uh, units or items. So we, if we decouple uh, the, uh, so we can reassemble them into another system, or if we decouple them from the platform, we, th we then can uh, reuse them on another platform. So this enables portability. Also testability, uh, decoupled components, they generally require simple tests and they can be developed independently in test-driven env test environment uh, using test-driven development. Yeah, so uh, if we focus on testability, the mock testing, it's fundamentally based on decoupling um, and dependency injection principles. So we provide mock implementation of dependencies that uh, perform some test specific um, actions or have some test specific behavior. And this we are doing for testing of our implementation. Yeah. So the composition would prevent this, that makes the decomposition crucial. And the testability, it is really well connected with portability and reusability because we are developing some component in the testing environment and then we port it into production environment and reuse it there. Um, to reason about applicability of different dependency injection techniques in different areas where C++ is used, we need to probably review some specifics, specifics of those areas. Um, here are some examples. Uh, we uh, can have some low latency applications. Those applications, they are designed for maximum runtime efficiency and typically have some hot paths or some part of the application that is the most performance critical one. And the layout there is uh, on this hot path is typically static. So that means that it is known at compile time. Uh, we also have some embedded applications. Those applications are typical, they, they can be limited uh, in some uh, in resources. So they can require some optimization for application size. Also, it is possible that the computational power of the platform will not be uh, there will be no abundance of this computational power, I would say, and still there will be necessity to achieve some runtime efficiency there. Uh, program structure there is also typically static. So the, we also have some user applications. 
of that are quite often built using some object-oriented frameworks. So we can have some UI frameworks, remote procedure calls frameworks, uh, some database accesses. Uh, those uh, also those applications can be designed to have some dynamic plugin architecture. We also have some software that can be built on top of the system APIs um, and uh, provide some extra um, services for upper layer uh, applications. We can call some platform software yeah? and they are typically based on those system APIs like POSIX, Windows or some board SDKs and embedded. So, um, to reason about the applicability of dependency injection techniques, we will consider those uh, the requirements from those domains that we just kind of reviewed. For example, for us, it's important if the dependency injection would introduce some runtime, um, dependency injection technique will introduce some runtime or size overhead, uh, if it will be applicable for runtime injection. Plus, we also are interested if the uh, dependency injection technique can be suitable for mock testing if it will really enhance the testability. And also, of course, what is important is general usability and what is the boilerplate overhead. So how is it really required? How much code is needed to really enable some uh, dependency injection based on some technique? Um, from efficiency point of view, uh, of course, it is important to mention that, of course, runtime characteristic, they will depend on platform and generated code. And the generated code, it would depend on target architecture, compiler, program structure, optimization features, et cetera. So um, we will review the code generation patterns. Uh, we'll observe them to reason about and runtime impact of some design decisions. And for this, we will review code generated uh, for x86-64 architecture mostly by uh, big three compilers, yes, yeah? so by GCC, Clang, and Microsoft Visual C compilers for with different optimization uh, options. So we will build uh, generate code uh, with optimization for execution speed. Uh, this is O3 for GCC Clang and uh, O2 for Microsoft compiler. And we also uh, will also see what code will be generated if we use the optimization for the um, executable size. So OS uh, for the um, Clank and GCC and o o one for the Microsoft Visual C. We will use trivial code samples. Uh, that will be enough. So the trivial code samples of basically single translation units where well, all dependent and dependent and dependency code they will be located in really in one single translation unit. This would be enough for the purpose of this presentation. Um, we will look at the overhead, like in direction extra code that will um, uh, that will be generated, and of course this relative overhead it can be unnoticeable for some types of applications. Um, on the other side, it can be very critical in some other settings. And of course, uh, I just wanted to mention, and this is important to um, highlight that. Evaluation of design decisions, of course, uh, as with any other decisions that are involving uh, performance considerations. Yeah? So those decisions, they should be evaluated um, and the trade-offs that should be done, they should be evaluated based on uh, measurements in project-specific environment. Yes. So, um, now about the dependencies in C++ programs. Yes, so what are the dependencies? What we can be dependent on? So uh, typically, if we apply decomposition, we can so some functionality then can be placed in classes, typically some functionality with the state. Uh, and so we can be dependent on the object of this objects of this, those classes. Or uh, some functionality can they also be placed in standalone functions, typically without the state, yes? So we can also be dependent on some functions. Um, and dependency injection techniques that are available in C++ language, they are, uh, uh, in, on, on language level are the inheritance-based runtime polymorphism, uh, polymorphic function wrappers. We also have um, inheritance from C, the function pointers that are still can be used. And also we have static or compiled and polymorphism. Yes, uh, so let's first start with inheritance-based runtime polymorphism. Uh, technically, uh, it is based on the principle that the client code should be dependent on class with virtual functions. Then concrete implementation uh, is injected, so the class that implements those virtual functions. 
And uh, this is a well-documented practice. Why? Because it overlaps with object-oriented design, uses the same language features. Um, and uh, offer, I would say that uh, um, here it is uh, reviewed from slightly different perspective uh, as more like a decoupling uh, technique than actually object-oriented design uh, feature. Yeah, so how the uh, code that uses this technique would look like. Yeah, so in best case, the dependency is specified using so-called interface. This is not a language feature, yeah, so interface, but I uh, mean that this is a class that only has pure virtual functions. So there is no implementation in the class. It just specifies the contract. And the uh, dependent code just uh, accepts uh, the this uh, interface in my case it does this by reference because it clearly specifies that the dependency is needed for the function yes and um, also the interface can also be uh, declared in a way that it can also specify what kind of ownership is then implied for example here the interface has the protected uh, destructor that prevents the destruction of the inherited uh, injected object from uh, using this interface. Uh, so this clearly, so this first of all, this prevents and also specifies um, uh, that, so prevents the destruction plus it specifies that the ownership is not passed into the function. Yeah, so the ownership is still controlled by the client code. Um, the dependency implementation, it then needs to inherit from the interface and uh, provide the implementation of the virtual functions. So here we have some basic implementation that just forwards the data. So in our example, uh, sorry, I didn't specify this. We have some backend and this backend has an output method. And here we have the file output that just forwards the uh, data into the file. Um, if we would like to slightly modify this uh, implementation, for example, would like uh, this file to be passed as a reference from somewhere, as from outside, or uh, just use a different stream, we will need to have another implementation or use some templates. But anyway, we will need to have a different association of uh, the uh, dependency implementation. If we will need to uh, have a, some dumb implementation that will be doing nothing, like just not, will not perform any output, we'll need to have another type as well. And um, if we need to forward a standalone function, uh, we will then also need to have it wrapped into another type. Yes, so here we have another implementation that just forwards the call to the standalone function. Uh, like here, so uh, unfortunately, uh, this would be required. From testability perspective, uh, this is also well-documented practice because it is typical for kind of object-oriented design as well. So we have, uh, we can implement the mock uh, object, the mock class, and then we can inject it instead of our uh, production implementation, uh, setting up some expectations and specifying the behavior that is specific for the test. Um, Let's have a look at what our uh, at what code will be generated if we use this dependency injection technique. To uh, for this purpose, I'm using, um, as I already mentioned, a very simple uh, sample. So I will have some interface and a simple implementation that will be just will have two methods. And it will just forward the calls to some um, C functions. This would be done to uh, to use those C functions as a markers within the generated code. They will be immediately visible, and the code just um, in so the one interface method uh, that is called interface method will be just calling this uh, C function standalone C function and multiplying the result by 1000 and another uh, interface method that is called like uh, is really called in another interface method it will be just calling uh, another function and just uh, forwarding the parameter to it uh, so the argument to it and the uh, client code 
that will be using this dependency, it uh, uh, will have uh, the following logic. So it will call the interface method and then depending on the, if the flag is set, um, it will call, it will either return the returned value if, it, if the flag uh, is set to true or will call the second interface method. Uh, interesting detail here, I will be always specifying flag to be true so making this code unreachable. So we, this will be used as also a marker of the level of optimization of the client code as well. So if this code will not be present, then we can see that this code was optimized away. Um, and um, to enable the dependency injection using this technique, yes, we create the instance of our dependency and just make the call passing this dependency into our function. I have multiple calls here to uh, affect the compiler decision for inlining. Uh, okay, so the code that will be generated for this trivial sample with optimization for speed uh, will look like this. For GCC and Clank, uh, the code is optimized. So we see that uh, this do something function was inlined, the calls were virtualized and non-reachable paths are removed. There is no uh, calls uh, that are unreachable here in the runtime. At the same time, if we look at the code that is generated by uh, MSVC, uh, we will see that it emits the instructions that correspond to indirect function calls. Yeah, so that we it is not uh, uh, it is it, it 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 did not optimize those uh, uh, dynamic features away. If we look at the code that will be generated by GCC, but for the optimization for the executable size, we will also notice that the inlining is not happening here anymore, and the function body remains as it is. So having those um, calls and uh, has the underlaying, uh, so it has the code that corresponds to the um, underlying implementation of this virtual code. So we have indirect calls here as well. Um, at the same time, if we change the platform and build the code for ARM platform with the same GCC compiler and also optimization for executable size, we will see that it will optimize those uh, virtual calls away. Uh, if we add the a bit uh, a couple of more calls to one of the interface methods, we will see that Clang for optimization uh, for uh, runtime efficiency will also start emitting some indirect calls. What does it show? So it illustrates my initial statement about uh, the fact that the compiler, so in the, the way what code will be generated, it really uh, is affected by multiple different factors. And uh, this should be definitely considered. Uh, another question would be, I'm mentioning here this indirection, is it a problem at all? And the answer, is it depends because so this in indirect calls they can introduce performance penalty in case of target mispredictions this can be mitigated by advanced hardware uh, if so depending on the predictability of target and the predictability of execution flows so if generally speaking if the calls are always coming to the same uh, location, then it will be predictable. But if hardware has this functionality, plus overall number of operations to really implement those indirections, so this uh, dynamic features of uh, uh, the uh, of the, those virtual calls, it will it is uh, those number of those operations greater than the number of uh, operations that are needed to perform just a, a direct call. Plus, uh, those operations, they include those uh, multiple um, memory accesses um, in form of the uh, this point of chasing, kind of multiple uh, consecutive memory accesses. And of course, real life impact uh, would depend uh, on project parameters and requirements, but it's important to understand what is happening under the hood of the, uh, if some techniques are used. Also, uh, one more uh, detail is that, uh, the 
uh, if the dependency and dependent code are located in different translation units, then also most likely the um, indirection will be uh, emitted. Uh, for example, here this GCC with the optimization for speed, it still um, implements those um, indirect calls. So some virtual function calls. And this can be um, uh, optimized by link time optimization if those dependencies are, can be resolved during link time. This is an important uh, feature that also should not be neglected. Yes, so here we see that those indirect calls, they were substituted by direct calls during the link time. Okay, so to summarize, uh, inheritance-based runtime polymorphism advantages. So we see that, yeah, so it works for runtime injection. Uh, that is suitable for various cases where we need a dynamic configuration or when we need to use some dynamic levers and plugins. Uh, we also can achieve a separation of compilation units. So the whole and, and isolation uh, of implementation details. Yes, yeah, so we can have the whole definition and declaration, everything to be sealed in uh, the source file and only the uh, interface can be exposed. This. Uh, this is an advantage, of course. Yeah. So um, on the other side, of course, it, those this technique also has limitations. Yeah. So the new types, they should be introduced to implement various behavior and those virtual methods resolution, uh, if it is uh, not optimized to wait, introduces extra executable code and indirect calls. Um, Next technique that is available for us. Uh, we have also polymorphic function wrappers. So this is based on type erasure and the standard supporting facility that enables this and the standard is a uh, stood function. There are also some uh, alternatives, including non-allocating alternatives. So for example, the STL fixed function or SG14 in place function, those they do not uh, need to allocate on the heap for capture list, uh, so that makes it suitable uh, for uh, in the environments where the heap allocation can be syncritical. Um, generally, uh, the code that would be dependent uh, on the polymorphic function wrapper, yes, it would look like that. So it accepts this the object, the wrapper object, and can call it using call operator, and the call operator will have the signature that is specified here as template arguments. Um, the client code can then has a lot of flexible ways of uh, specifying the dependency implementation. For example, it can be just simplified. It can be just specified using lambda expression like as a lambda function. Uh, there can be, for example, here some file object is captured and then some output is forwarded to that. So this is the alternatives for our uh, process data implementation that we had before in the previous section. We, here we just forward to the file. We do not need to um, create some other types. We can specify just another Lambda function if we just want to have the file created here uh, in the uh, body of the um, Lambda function uh, locally. Yeah? So we can also just forward the standalone function here or uh, write the simple Lambda expression just to specify that no operation should be done. Yes, so this uh, is really convenient because there is no necessity to introduce new types inherited from anything. So there can be just simple implementation that is injected. This really pro uh, provides a really loose coupling uh, between dependent and dependency, a uh, dependent code and dependency. Uh, the, for this, this technique is praised. Uh, also important to mention that it works very well for um, as a, some form of substitution of the single method interfaces. For example, we can have uh, a function like store records that requires some formatter for record or writer for record. And those would be probably some single method interfaces, but we can just provide a simple function, so our function wrapper that will uh, store the implementation of this functionality. Uh, 
similar thing with some um, IP address resolver that can be just injected into some function that implements connection to host. Uh, also can be used to implement some uh, factory function like here in the load configuration, there is a necessity to, uh, uh, pr to create some plugins based on the name and uh, we can just in inject this functionality into the load configuration file. For testability, it's quite a convenient way um, because we can just simply, regardless of what is injected in production code, here we can just uh, inject, uh, so forward the calls to some mock object that we can capture. Uh, for the tests, uh, for the uh, examples of the test code, I'm using uh, I'm using the uh, GTAS GMOC framework. Or uh, we can just uh, just forward the uh, mock object by reference uh, if it has the implementation of the call operator. So, offer it will still need to to forward the call because we cannot mock just the call operator, but uh, generally, it is uh, convenient because uh, regardless of what we injected, including also standalone functions, we still can check that the calls uh, were correct. Yes, so just injecting the mock object. And from uh, efficiency point of view, let's look at uh, the code that will be generated for this technique. We are using here again our do something function that has the same logic. We call one function, uh, one wrapper object. Then, um, in case of the uh, if uh, the flag is not set, we can call another one. And uh, those are the two wrappers that are injected. And we inject uh, the same logic that we had before. So we just uh, have a wrapper that multiplies the result of some standalone C function, and we inject some C function directly because we uh, uh, don't, are not anyhow altering its result, or we just need to forward uh, the, the argument to it. And uh, if we look at the code that is generated, this is the code that is generated by GCC for um, runtime efficiency optimization. We see that there is a massive overhead here. Uh, the, a lot of code is generated, and there is indirection here. There is There are also some checks because the uh, because the object should throw if it does not uh, hold the function, if it's empty. We also have uh, some uh, resolution of what is really stored there because so we have here the uh, type erasure implementation. Um, so we see that, yeah, there is a clear um, trade-off between uh, usability and some uh, performance here. Interesting detail that Clank actually has a feature it can optimize this away. So it really optimizes well those wrappers, uh, especially std function. It also can optimize away the um, uh, the alternatives like ESTL, EASTL e e e e function, fixed function. But with STD function, it really uh, performs the, uh, so works very well. But this is when, uh, the injected type is really known during the compile time. So again, in a, in a very um, simple, trivial case. But unfortunately, yeah, this is the unique feature. Um, Microsoft compiler will produce something uh, similar to what GCC, uh, GCC uh, uh, generated. So some uh, overview, yes, yeah? so some, uh, some summary. Polymorphic function wrappers, they definitely have advantages. Yes, so we do not need to introduce new types. Uh, their dependency can simply be adapted using lambda expressions. Uh, translation units, uh, they can be separated as well because, uh, because the, uh, the type that is stored in the function is erased. So that means that it also can be implementation can be hidden and only the function can be then just provided to the client code. So the, the repo can be provided to the, to the client code. And uh, it's of course applicable for runtime injection. So it can be injected uh, on the runtime. And we can also inject standalone functions without necessity to wrap it. So, okay. Uh, still we saw that it has 
some limitations. Yeah? So it introduced runtime overhead. Uh, we saw that there were some indirect calls uh, plus some extra logic. It is unlikely to be optimized. There are some exceptions, but uh, yes, this is still a, uh, quite a unique feature. And uh, we need one wrapper object per interface method. Yes, so if the interfaces are more complex, uh, and in some cases they are, so it might not, might be uh, not well scalable. Okay, so uh, function pointers is the next uh, technique and for runtime technique uh, that is available in C++ programs. Uh, this is based, uh, so this is a technique that is uh, available since C language is inherited from C, uh, but as it is still used, especially in the areas where C++ um, needs to interact with C code. Uh, the idea is that the pointers to functions are just passed to dependent code. Uh, it is very widely used and um, embedded in low level software. And it enables polymorphism in C programs. So, uh, uh, how does it look like? So, the, uh, to use this technique, we typically pass either a single function pointer or we can aggregate several function pointers in the structure, um, like here, and then we just pass it uh, into the function. So this is uh, the technique that is really can be seen a lot in C code. C++ version can be slightly modified and modernized so we can have this left to right uh, function pointers declarations uh, using this add pointer t alias. Uh, but the kind of uh, usage will look the same. Yeah, so we can pass uh, these uh, set of, uh, so not the set, but just actually this aggregation table of uh, containing those function pointers, and then we just call them indirectly. Um, what is quite important, um, unfortunately, this is quite rare the case, but the uh, those um, aggregated function pointers, they also can uh, be associated uh, with some context. And this context, it can be just uh, passed in form of void pointer to the uh, dependent code. And this dependent code then can call uh, the, uh, the functions just passing this context into those functions. This could uh, provide possibility to really associate some data with the function calls and uh, significantly enhance interoperability between C++ and C code because this can then, the call can then be associated with some object. And uh, if the C and C++ code are co-designed to work together, then this is the uh, implementation, so design, design detail that uh, shouldn't be neglected. It really simplifies interoperability. Um, okay, let's look at what code is generated for, for functions, uh, for the function pointers. We can have uh, the, so our sample code is again the same. We are uh, using the standalone C functions. We also have this wrapper to alter the result of the function call uh, here. And we are just assigning those uh, so we are uh, initializing these function pointers uh, uh, within the uh, structure using this wrapper here uh, for, uh, yeah, instead of uh, just a, a direct call because we need to multiply the result by 1000. And uh, here we are using C++20 feature designated initializers. So they are now available unfortunately only starting from C++20, but of course it makes code uh, more readable and actually safer, yeah, so that we really specify proper, uh, that we initialize proper fields here. And then we make multiple calls again, and we can see that even uh, uh, for, uh, yeah, we provide the function pointers here. So we, yeah, we can see that uh, it is, uh, well handled by the compilers. All of the compilers, they uh, eliminated the indirections. 
Uh, so and also all eliminated this unreachable code. So they optimized the client code uh, well. Yes, some of the compilers also optimized the mathematical um, expression. Here we had multiple additions there, and uh, it takes out the multiplication then. Um, so just uh, producing more efficient mathematical expression. Um, unfortunately, if we start experimenting with different uh, parameters. We will have same effects that we saw uh, for the um, inheritance-based runtime polymorphism. For example, here, if we uh, built by GCC for uh, with optimization for executable size, we again see that the do something function will not be unlined, and the uh, body of the function will contain those indirect calls to the function. So, and the repo function that was inlined. Uh, uh, in our previous example, now uh, is not aligned anymore. So there is a. So again, uh, we see that yes, the um, uh, underlying implementation, and this is like an explicit indirection because we are using the function pointers here. It can then uh, this this implementation can just stay in the code depending on how the compiler is optimizing this. And this is again uh, a simple, very uh, a simple, trivial code sample where everything is visible for compiler on compile time, single translation unit. OK, uh, the advantages, yes, of the function pointers technique. So we uh, it works for C code. It can be used for uh, standalone functions and, um, and can be used for runtime injection as well. Yes, so this is, those are the, uh, the primary advantages. Uh, on the other hand, it they introduce a direct call overhead, if not optimized away. Yes, uh, that can th this overhead can this indirection can prevent compiler optimization, uh, further compiler optimization, and also function pointer. They are not associated with an object if not designed to accept this context. Yes, uh, so that means that if we need to from these functions, uh, we need to have. Uh, we need to associate some data with those function calls. For example, some state, we will need to use singletons, including we will, including uh, test scenarios where we will need to have some singleton mocks. Uh, this is not uh, very, very good, yeah? Okay, so generally the technique uh, seems to be applicable for uh, interaction with C code but unlikely to be really useful in the C++ programs where other options are available. Okay, so now a couple of words in general about optimizations for the runtime polymorphism and for different options that involve this runtime polymorphism that we mentioned before. So we can see that optimizations, those like removal of indirection and lining they are not guaranteed, yeah? So they are features of the tooling and sometimes they can happen or not. And we saw the different cases where uh, this optimization is actually was impossible, did not happen. Um, if dependencies can be resolved only at runtime, then of course, uh, then we will have the uh, uh, indirection because this is how this dynamic binding is implemented. If dependencies um, can be resolved in link time, then LTO is, poss if, is possible if it is available and should not be neglected. Um, if dependencies and dependent code are located in a single translation units in a, the way in the way that we use in our examples, this can provide a maximum uh, level of visibility for compiler and enable the, the maximum level of optimization possibilities. But generally, it defies the dynamic features of those techniques and uh, also defies the source code isolation. Um, so as a summary for runtime polymorphism, um, I just wanted to mention that still the usage of those techniques is inevitable for some types of applications because they support the uh, really uh, runtime uh, dependency injection. They really can provide high level of dependency isolation. Yeah, we can hide the implementation details, um, split the uh, translation units, hide the dependencies in source code. 
we can, um, but they can introduce the runtime and size overhead, even for programs with static structure. We uh, saw that we have some application types that have uh, static structure, that primarily have static structure. At the same time, they prioritize performance. Uh, alternative for runtime um, dependent injection techniques can be something that is not based on the indirection, but uh, still has the limitations, but that can be um, acceptable for the types of application where performance is more important. The alternative uh, that is definitely uh, should be mentioned is a static or compiled time polymorphism. The uh, idea behind it is that the dependent code uh, has to be generic, yes, so it should be either function or cluster blade. And that dependency type is specified uh, as a template argument. And dependency and dependent code just uh, need to be compatible. That means that template parameter substitution sh should not fail. As a simple example, here we have our process data function uh, where now it's called generic process data and it uh, is template now, a function template now, and it accepts something, generally speaking, yeah, that can be uh, called uh, passing the data as parameter. Uh, then the use cases for this type of injection can look visually very similar to what we had with polymorphic function uh, wrappers. Yeah? So here we also can specify the some lambda expressions so we can inject some closures. Uh, we can also inject the standalone functions. We can inject the, uh, we can yeah simply uh, have the same uh, lambda functions that we used before. The difference here is that, that th those are all different instantiations of the uh, function template. So those are all different uh, instances of the function that are called here, having different dependency types. Um, from performance point of view and the generated code here, uh, let's do another experiment. So here we again have the same layout of the client code, of the dependent code. We have two functions and uh, we pass those functions. In one case, we pass this again, this wrapper. In another uh, case, we pass the function directly. And the generated code uh, will look, uh, so will be optimized. Yeah, so we can see that again, uh, free compilers for optimization for runtime um, runtime efficiency for uh, runtime speed uh, will uh, optimize this well. Yes, yeah, so again, uh, eliminate indirection. Again, uh, unfortunately, if we use the uh, change the optimization parameters like here GCC for size we can notice that the we will again see similar layout as we saw when we use the function pointers. We'll see some indirection. And this is happening uh, because actually we injected the function pointers. So we here pass the function pointers into our function template. And this, uh, Affected, of course, the generated code because the dependency type will be really like a uh, like a, a function pointer. So that means uh, we uh, 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 the call was not inlined, and the function pointers they just stayed the same way as they were kind of provided into the template. So here the functions are injected. It is visible from the uh, uh, from the um, types that were deduced by the compiler. So um, alternatively, if instead of passing the function kind of directly, 
we can wrap the calls to the function into lambda expressions and lambda functions and inject the corresponding uh, closure objects. And in this case, if we just do it like this, we'll, the code that will be generated will not contain any indirection because there was none in the source code. There was no uh, indirection uh, because the function pointers were not involved. Only direct calls were performed in the call operators of the closures that were generated. So here we see that the code is uh, optimized. Yes, so that uh, the dependent function is in line. The wrapper still still is not in line, but there are no indirect calls. This is an important detail because it is also mm, kind of highlights the uh, feature that if we are using this different types of static polymorphism, then the type of dependency can also affect the generated code. Uh, okay. So we were talking about a generic function, but we also can have, of course, so about the uh, function template, we can also have class template. Um, here we just need to provide the, um, so that there should be a, a template parameters that would correspond to the dependency types. Yes, and they should be then injected uh, in this case by reference. Uh, std reference wrapper might be required here if we need to provide some copy or and assignment operations. Otherwise, it will not work. Instead of uh, multiple dependencies, one single class that uh, implements this API or provides this functionality can be injected. Yes, yeah, so here we combine two different um, methods and just made some dependency type. Uh, we require that the dependency type just implement both of them. Yes, yeah, so something like this. And we also can have uh, our interface be adjusted depending on some declarations within the dependency type. So for example, here the return type will depend on the nested value type declaration from dependency type. Um, if we uh, to our if we implement the forwarding constructor to our dependent class, that would be just forwarding the dependency dependencies uh, based on the value category of the. Uh, of the provided dependency, yes, and then also supplement uh, the declaration with the uh, template argument deduction guide that would link the parameters of the forwarding constructed to the parameters of the class template. We can enable possibility uh, that the dependency can be then injected uh, using left or left value or R value references. And it can be then either shared by reference or just owned by the dependent class. So the use case for this um, in our simple model would look like this. There will be possibility to either pass the parameter by L value reference or just by R value reference here in case of temporary, or we can use move here. Uh, the um, Example of the application of this technique, um, I will uh, provide in the next section, but a couple of more details here. So of course, if we use this approach, then we will need to use this remove reference here because we, uh, if the type can be deduced as a reference, then we need to remove it to get access to the net nested declaration. And before that, we discussed that we have we have um, uh, we need to have the dependency type be compatible with the dependent code. This is uh, not very descriptive. C plus plus twenty offers uh, option to really specify that within the code. So we can use concepts to describe the dependency type. 
For example, here we generally require that the our dependency path has the methods called some function and another function, and that they are related in the way that the type that uh, so the the return type of the first method uh, should uh, be accepted uh, as a parameter uh, by uh, uh, the second method. Yes, and this is um, will then allow to verify the dependency without instantiation of dependent code it will also be more descriptive because it really specifies some form of the contract it then will provide better diagnostics because the uh, constraint uh, this constraints verification diagnostics is generally better than the one that is provided when the template instantiation fails so and it will allow independent uh, development of dependent of the dependency uh, code uh, it will not require the uh, so the uh, presence of the dependent code to really verify uh, to, to to verify conformance to the contract and then this concept generally can be used uh, everywhere where we uh, specify the template parameter constraining uh, it's uh, just constraining it. Okay, uh, now a short example how these techniques techniques can be combined, this uh, compile time techniques. Um, let's look at this class. That is the synchronized stack that uh, is generally some form of adapter that uses some um, container as a backend storage and provide some synchronized read safe access to it. So here we have like push, we have push method that uh, needs to uh, lock some synchronization primitive that is also uh, the type of which is also specified as a template parameter. And uh, we need to develop this logic and also uh, we need to verify and uh, test it. So here, the backend type is specified, and the uh, synchronization primitive type, they are constrained using concepts. And so we, those concepts, they can be specified like this. For uh, mutex or for everything that behaves like mutex, we can use uh, a concept called lockable. There is, so this would correspond to the lockable named requirement. So there is no concept like this in the standard library so far, but we can implement one. Everything that can be locked and then lock is uh, corresponds to the named requirement lockable. And we uh, can also specify concept that is called stack-like stack accessible. This is will uh, require presence of the methods that will allow efficient implementation of the stack. So we require that the Story that the container that will be used as backend uh, has those methods. So in this case, it's slightly more complex, but in, uh, we need pushback, probably popback, but we are uh, here limiting uh, only what we need in this example. Um, everything that would correspond to the lockable concept will be compatible with these standard facilities like scoped lock or unique lock. Uh, here we use one. And we need to take this log before we uh, actually access the container. Uh, the proper contract we can verify just in the unit test environment by providing some mock implementation of vector and mutex. So here we have the mocks that have the pushback method for vector and lock and lock for, uh, for the mutex. And if we implement the same technique that we mentioned before, that we have the forwarding constructor and deduction guide. So here are the types and so uh, the types uh, of the uh, so the arguments of the constructor uh, will then specify and define the uh, arguments of the whole class template. So we can then just, if this is implemented, then we can uh, just 
instantiate our adapter using the types of, and using the objects, uh, our mock objects, that will be then injected instead of uh, real uh, production dependencies. So here we constructed passing those uh, references to the smoke objects, and then they are then become arguments of the synchronized tech class template. So having this, we can then just simply specify our expectation that the calls to lock push back and unlock is happening in sequence. Then we trigger our API function of synchronized stack and we need to, and if everything is um, correct, then we can pass the test. The potential issue that can be found here, for example, if we have this uh, temporary uh, lock, we forget to, if we uh, forget uh, to give uh, a name to it, then it will exist only on this line. So that means that lock and unlock will be happening before the pushback is happening. So we can verify the contract. And as we have also default parameters for, uh, so default types for template parameters, and also we have default constructor, we can still create our synchronized stack just providing the value type that we want to store here. And then the default types will be used. In our case, it will be vector and uh, just a, st a stud mutex. If we would like to adapt already existing objects, then we also can use it similar in a way similar to our vector, uh, to, similar to the way how we did this with the mock objects before. Okay, so last detail that I wanted to mention. We saw that we are quite limited in the way how we can uh, how we can um, inject the standalone functions as dependencies. Or for it, sometimes it is necessary because they can implement some logic that uh, can uh, be uh, that that. that First of all, should be sometimes should be uh, substituted by some uh, mocks for testability. In some cases, it just really should be uh, spe sh should be dependent uh, on the, some uh, environment and, for example, on the platform. So we can inject a platform dependent API, for example. Uh, and we saw that we can do this using the function pointers. We can do this using the polymorphic function wrappers, but those are those runtime techniques that can introduce these interactions we saw before. Yeah. So, um, alternative to this is to wrap those calls into some uh, into uh, the some into methods of some objects that we can um, inject instead. So we see, sorry, an example where we just wrap it into the um, closure call operator, yes, yeah? so, uh, using the Lambda function. Uh, another way is just, yes, to try to attach those standalone functions and wrap them into the methods of some structure that we can then also inject uh, in the class of function template. Um, in this case, we forward uh, those calls to the C function or another function. This can be generalized to avoid uh, some potential uh, defects in the forwarding of arguments or, uh, or in the forwarding of return value. So generally we can uh, use the perfect forwarding here just to simply forward everything that will be fast, everything that will be passed for the class method to the standalone function. This can also be then um, uh, just wrapped in some uh, macro definition here. Uh, so this would allow some form of uh, attaching of the standalone functions to the to some class. Uh, here we are using our macro, and this would uh, be expanded to something like this. And this 
also enables the testability. So if we have some code that is dependent on some API, attaching those to, to, the, to an object and injecting the mock instead of the uh, real um, implementation that really forwards to their uh, production API can then be used to test the dependent code. So with uh, still, there is no polymorphism, uh, like runtime polymorphism involved here. There are no function pointers involved here. The code remains suitable for further compiler optimization. Okay, so a couple of, uh, uh, couple of words as a, a summary for static polymorphism. So we see that the indirect calls, they can be avoided. It provides really good potential for uh, inlining and further optimizations. So, uh, and it can be used to substitute dependencies on concrete types. So we do not need to uh, be dependent on some interfaces, like on the on the on the function with, uh, on the classes with virtual functions. We also do not uh, involve type erasure somehow here. So we can just have already implemented concrete types, and we can just inject them. They just should follow some contract. But limitations are also quite obvious. Yes, so the dependent code, it has to be generic. Uh, the dependency injection is only happening on compile time, so it's static. It's, used only for st uh, it's suitable for static code only. The dependent code and dependencies, um, they also have to be in a single translation unit. Yes, so this can increase compilation time. This also, uh, like a separation of source code is, um, maybe not the best in that case, but it supports compiler optimization because it provides a good visibility for a compiler. Yes. Uh, if we look at the um, compile time injection from test-driven development perspective, then we can notice that it enables some form of top-down design approach. Yeah, when we have some form of the dependency inversion, so we can define the interfaces uh using the concepts yes yeah? so um in some way yes yeah? so uh that means that the code for dependency can be then uh, uh so the code the dependent code can then be developed independently and uh, the concept will specify the contract for for dependencies yes yeah? so um and also Apart from top-down approach, it also enables bottom-up approach. When we already have some um, components that we would like to use uh, in some code, and instead of using those existing components, we can start building our code using some uh, mock implementations to verify the logic that we are developing without being dependent on these concrete types. And then in production environment, we then can inject those. So this was demonstrated by our examples with the vector on mutex. And um, we can really achieve some decomposition without runtime overhead. So if we need to have some decomposition for to increase the stability uh, without sacrificing the uh, runtime efficiency, this can be achieved uh, using uh, compile time or static polymorphism. So short summary, uh, yes. So runtime uh, techniques, they are, suitable for dynamic program structure. Uh, because of this, yeah, the way how it is implemented, there can be some extra code and indirection that can be unacceptable for performance critical areas. This should be considered. We have their dependency on compiler optimization capabilities. So generally, if compilers can remove this and direction, de-virtualize calls if their link time optimization is available. Static. Uh, polymorphism, uh, it does not involve any indirection of virtual calls. It is unlikely to inhibit compiler optimization, so, but it's suitable for static program parts only. Uh, short, uh, the summary for performance considerations. Yes, so it is important to reiterate again that the design decisions, they are always should be based on uh, measurements in the specific settings where the code will be really running. Behavior of tooling can be different. Yes, so the tooling that is used in the project, it should always be considered in a concrete project, yes. So the uh, 
of course, runtime and uh, size overhead, it depends on compiler optimization. So the proper options, they always should be, they, they should be used, the proper compiler options, yes. And compiler uh, optimization can be inhibited by indirection that what we saw, um, those compile time solutions, they do not introduce indirection. Uh, if we not explicitly, uh, if we, are not explicitly injecting the function pointers. Yes, so we need to be careful here, but generally the compile time uh, injection is not based on indirection. And it is unlikely to block this compile the compile optimization effort. And yes, compile, we can say that compile time polymorphism uh, is preferred for decomposition of the functionality on uh, some application hot path. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, so there was another talk, uh, test-driven development of embedded uh, and system level software for which some of this material was prepared. It is more focused on test-driven development, of course, and it has more details from test-driven development perspective. So if there is interest for that, uh, then please also uh, refer to it. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much for attention. And if you have any questions, let's discuss them. Thank you for your talk. This was really uh, nice to hear about dependency in sections and the various patterns for it and C code and comparisons. Um, very interesting. Um, if you have any questions that you didn't get answered during the talk or want to generally talk to Vladimir, he'll be available on the launch. And so that's kind of the last talk for today at the conference. So, um, you know, take your time. And uh, Vladimir will be in the launch for the next 20, 30 minutes. Um, if you Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you let's go there. for your talk. And with that, I'm going to end um, this live stream.